Director. We have, yes, someone who is working the technology, and so we thank God, right, because before I even talked to her, she had already uh, talked to me about certain things that God had just put in her heart, and she had no idea that I was already going to talk to her about it. So see, that's what God does. Amen. And so um, she'll be doing the technology. Please put her in your prayers. Amen. Amen. Because when we serve, we're serving unto the Lord, Amen. not unto man. We serve unto the Lord. And when we serve unto the Lord, we serve in a spirit of excellence, right? Not perfection, but in a spirit of excellence. So what, what God places in our hands that we may learn to value, that we may learn to see that, oh, my God, this is unto God, not unto man. And we do it, right, Evelyn? Excellent. Oh, in a spirit of excellence, right? To please him, to honor him. So it, it, it places a responsibility on us. Ay, 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 ay. Responsibility, meaning that now there's a level of expectation on my life in terms of holiness and righteousness, and right? Because I am now part of God's service. Amen? And that's where we want all of you guys, sooner or later, in the service of the Lord. Amen? So I have, I've given you guys a, um, how many received your worksheet? Right? Are you recording now? <laughs> okay, so somebody read me the top, what it says on the top of the fingerprint. Your fingerprint is unique to you. It's a physical mark of your identity. What about your personal identity? What defines who you are? So that's just a question for you, right? What defines you? What defines you? And so in the back, you will find, oh, well, you've got a fingerprint, and what does it have on it? Oh, a cross. It has a cross, right? And so in the back, you have a list of Bible verses that tells you exactly who you are in Christ, everything that we are in Christ. So anytime you feel like the devil is just bullying you and trying to make you think like you're nobody and that unworthiness wants to hit or the sadness that nobody likes me, nobody loves me, well, that's a lie because, you know, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves me, and he's left his word, right? He's left his word to reiterate and validate, right? The thing is, we need to accept it. We believe it and accept it and declare it in our lives. So I wanted to hand that to you. Uh, we are in our second part. We're going to end with this vulture. Of un uh, now we're going to talk about unworthiness and low self-worth. Last week, we were dealing with the insecurity, how many received some, something last night? I mean, last night. Last week. Amen. Okay, let's go on to it. What you received? Wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start when they start. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're, you're the letter A and you're at the beginning. Ah, exacto. <laughs> so you got to be prepared. So just one thing. One thing that, that comes to mind that kind of like, hmm, that, that touched you. Well, I mean, I, identi I ident identify myself. Mm -hmm. um, the way I was back then. Though. Okay. Like, not right now. Uh huh. Like that I was mean. I was a mean person. I used to. I used to bully other people. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And things what? like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Wow. <laughs> so we had to bully our myths. Thank you, Jesus, for transformation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right. How about you, Stephanie? What you get from last week? Um. Everything makes sense now. Okay. For what I was going through, like right now, I can identify like everything. Praise Jesus. And I can work on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So your God is literally opening up your mind, and you're able to see. Oh my God, identifying, and you're able to work on it. Praise God for that. How about you, Stephanie? Well, I drew the drawing because it's taking off my mask. Oh Jesus. Because I pretty much identify with that. I pretty much have permanent angry on my face. So I pretty much just. I posted that, yeah, I had told her, I said, post it on ban, right? And what, uh, I mean, it was just, you know when it says, a, a picture says a thousand words? I think that said a thousand and more words because it literally, when you take off the mask, what do you see? And sometimes we're afraid to take off the mask because we're afraid to truly see ourselves, right? But it's important to do that. Thank you for sharing. How about you, Evelyn? Um, if we have our identity in the world, we will always, we'll always measure ourselves to that. So then it's important to know. Who, what is my identity, mm -hmm. and are we lacking identity? Mm. That's, that was the one that, that I was like. Amen, amen. How about you, day? Uh, for me, what sticks more was um, to have the, our identity issues fixed or healed. We have to have a better relationship with God because He's the only one who can. Amen, amen. So if we got some identity issues, we need to go to the source. Right? And and the one that only can give us that identity is Jesus Christ. Right? Amen. How about you, Marissa? So, um, I wrote down, if you uh, don't deal with the giant of insecurity, 
it will kill you. So this is, yeah, the insecurity mm -hmm. vulture. And then also the part about um, how fathers are important yes. in their daughter's um, lives. So that, that kind of hit me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's Absolutely. part of our... Um, if you have not such a great role model as a father, then your insecurities as you grow up are kind know, of like it, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you can see the importance as we talked about it last week. The importance <clears throat> and significance of a father figure, yeah, in a in a in a child's life. Yes, well, I'll speak to that from from the opposite yes. perspective because my dad to me it was so good, and I'm such a daddy's girl yeah. that I created insecurity from not wanting to disappoint him, not wanting him to be mad at me, not wanting for him to not love me, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so... That, that brought that about its different. own dysfunction. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know? So yes, it's not absolutely. bad or absent fathers. It could be, you know, having a good dad also yeah. created its own. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Is that what you were going to share? No. Okay. What did you, just, what did you get? I was just like, yeah. oh, wait, I had the same thing from the other end. So what did you get thing, last week? And it was a confirming word because this is what the pastor preached about on Sunday, so I love that part. The doubt versus unbelief. Mm. That was a big factor for me, that um, the enemy wants to cause us to doubt God. And once we begin to doubt God, then that's where insecurity can seep in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the way that you explain that you cannot doubt in order for you to doubt something you have to believe it first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then the difference between doubt and unbelief where yeah. unbelief is you just refuse to accept it and you mm -hmm. refuse to believe it right right so that was a great like oh look seeing the difference between yeah. the two things and so remember and we'll talk about I'll just touch it a little bit um doubt is a struggle while unbelief is a condition Okay, so we'll see that a little bit later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alexis, what'd you get last week? Well, I got, um, um, the whole how <coughs> insecurity is, uh, basically another word for fear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, All right, thank you. So today we're going to end up finishing up to deal with this vulture so we can kill it. So we can kill it. Remember that this vulture is in tandem with the one of doubt. They work in, in cahoots with each other. And you're going to find out, <laughs> you're going to find out that the one that we deal with next week, procrastination, ha! It's right in there as well. They're all attached. It's like they're all weaned together, right? And so... Why Why are we dealing with this? Because this is what the Lord is bringing to my heart to bring to you guys. Because these are things, as I've been doing one-to-ones, as I've been praying, as I've been uh, uh, just spiritually monitoring and, and asking Holy Spirit. These are things that a lot of you, a lot of you, I should say all of you, all of you, that you've got some struggles at different levels with these three vultures. And so when you're bringing, just like Stephanie said, wow. You bring the information, you're breaking it down to the point that now I'm able to identify it in my own life and I got to get to work. So how many of you are going to get to work? Because the Bible says work out your salvation with what? With fear and trembling. I mean, we need to work. We need to work. And the Bible says that the time is now to work because there will come a time when there's no more time to work. And, and, and if you're a procrastinator, don't wait till the Lord comes for you to try to get it together because it'd be too late. Okay? So we're going to work on this. How many are... are, are are saying, you know what, this year I'm working on my stuff, Amen. right? This year I'm going to kill that giant, like Maritza said, I'm going to kill that giant, right? One of the deepest and darkest emotions that we have to contend with, and it's the sinking low self-worth that usually starts early in life, right? It's that low self-worth. It's like, I'm, I'm stupid, I'm ugly, I'm not even worth nothing, nobody loves me, why am I even here? You know, have you ever heard those voices before, right? And so uh, I got some statistics. According to Parent24, in a world obsessed with perfect selfies, <laughs> in a world obsessed with perfect, there's that word, selfies, 70% uh, of the girls feel that they are not good enough. 70% of the girls feel they are not good enough. 
by the time they become 17 years of age, 78% of the girls are unhappy with their bodies. And more than 90% admit to feeling pressure to look a certain way or that they would change something about how they look if they could, all for the sake of feeling worthy and accepted in the eyes of others. All for the sake of feeling worthy and accepted in the eyes of others. So just think about it. I'm going to look up here. So think about it. Just ask yourself, have I done anything? Have I been doing anything? Have I behaved in a manner that I'm trying to get attention of others so that they could validate, they can make me feel accepted, they can make me feel worthy, right? So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that today. Cambridge Dictionary defines uh, unworthiness and, and, and uh, worthlessness as the feeling or fact of being unimportant. I'm unimportant. It's, it's, it's the feeling of uselessness. I'm not, I'm not good for nothing. Huh? Maybe, maybe that's something that you heard growing up. I, you're not good for nothing. I, you know, in Spanish, excuse my language, I'm going to be very blunt. But in the Puerto Rican way, they would be telling us, tu no, tu no pa llevar a, to go do their bathroom. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Those of you that grew up in the Puerto Rican, tu no sirve ni pa llevar pejo a, a pupu. Right? I mean, just the, sometimes growing up, We've received some messages, and we'll talk about that, okay? So it's a feeling of not good enough. It's, it's unworthy and undeserving. So, so it's embedded in us. Embedded. Embedded. It's, it's, been, it's been illegally placed within us. And my objective today, God help me, Holy Spirit help me. My objective today is that today you will, you will literally you will receive understanding. You will literally see things with clarity. And, and you will see that the devil, not God, the devil from the very get-go, since you were in the womb of your mama, has been planning and scheming to really destroy your life. And how has he done it? By coming and, and, and coming in and embedding things in your mind. So there's been some trespassing illegal trespassing there, there's been there's been some 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 things that have come into my life that I wasn't aware of things that came into my life even against my will and now it's embedded in me what does embed mean not not like you're laying down in bed I'm talking embedded deep within deep within <coughs> And metal, um, we have a punch, and we hit it with a hammer, and we leave the mark of whatever was mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. the mark. Oh, wow. Jesus, Jesus! Thank you. That was a perfect conversation. I was thinking of a splinter, but no, mm -hmm. that's way better. Don't make fun of my stick figure. That's actually really good. Yeah. Okay. So. The black stuff is your brain. Sorry. I'm just. It's not here. It's your brain. Okay. It's your brain. And so. You use. What did you use? What was it that you used hammer. to embed? Hammer. Okay. So we got a hammer. It looks like a little hammer with a little... Okay, I'm not going to draw. Hammer symbolizes the devil. And the hammer, so the hammer, so you, you had, what did you say? What was... It, it's a little punch. Okay, so let's say it's like a bead or something. It's, it's literally another piece of metal that's hardened. Okay, another piece of metal. Let's just say all these little things are pieces of metal. Okay? It's, it's like... The... Oh, let's, let's draw a little stick then. Yeah. Okay, so it's little sticks. These little sticks are going to be embedded in metal. So the devil represents the hammer. Okay? And so the devil comes and embeds. I put it in red. Literally comes from early age, even from when we're in the womb of our mom. Let's see, that's it. 
And then he was pregnant. Skinny with a little bit. Okay, that's all you see is belly. Okay? The enemy even comes when mama is pregnant with you inside. Okay? Comes to what? Now let me draw it in green so you'll see it. It brings these 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 metal, what did you call these? Punches. Punches. Ooh. So it brings these punches, okay? Since you're in there in the mama's belly, right? It can come through mama's words. I didn't even want this kid. I should have bought this kid. Why am I? I'm a young mom. I can't deal. I got my own life to live. I don't want this baby. Rejection already speaking into the life of that child. There's the embedding. So, so the devil sees both mom. There's the cycle of cyclic. Remember last week? Both sees the mom and then sees that, oh my God, that's potential. Oh my God, that's a threat to my kingdom. Especially when there's been a decree or a declaration that a pr uh, somebody has come and prayed over your mom and says, the child within you is separated and consecrated from my purposes. Then guess what? The devil, which is a hammer, brings about tons of punches. He schemes and says, I got to destroy this child. But the only way to do it is by illegal trespassing so I can embed the punches. So I'm going to embed the punches since the baby's in the womb. And then I'm going to embed the punches when the child is a toddler. Then I'm going to embed the punches when it's growing up into five, six, seven, eight-year-old. Then I'm going to embed the punches when it's an adolescent and developing no father figure, a mom who is divorced or, or poverty or dysfunction and all these punches. And we're here today. And God says, I'm bringing you a word that's going to reveal to you the punches of your past so you can get rid of them and get that healed. So you can then walk into your destiny and your purpose fully healed. So you can walk into your marriage fully healed. So you can have now children of your own without having to think of generational curses. Thank you. That was great. Yes, ma'am. Yes, go ahead. Well, when you use a punch to the metal, the only way to take the mark off is to grind it up. Aye, aye. Mm. And that's why some of us complain about our processes. And some of us don't understand. See, when we don't have understanding and clarity, and we don't have, like some of us are type A personality, and we want an agenda, like description of where, where am I going to be put today? Lord, what are you going to do with me? What? And God says, I don't have to give that. All I require from you is obedience, trust, and have faith that I got your back. And so in order to get that grinded out, it's called the process. You got a lot of sermons, my dear. <coughs> you got a lot of sermons, and that's why the devil hits you so hard. And that's why he's trying to thwack you out. Of what God says you need to be in. And the problem is, he spoke to you last year about your emotions. And that's why you've been on the ride of your life. Mm -hmm. And process after process to grind out those areas of immaturity. To grind out those areas of hurt. And to really put a stop finally to that fear that keeps taunting you. Why? Because... From early on, he's been hammering at you. He's trespassed illegally into your life. But God's brought you into a brand new season. Amen? Amen. 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 How many are in a new season? Amen. I know I am. Hallelujah for that. Thank you, Jesus. Self-worth. So, so the Urban Dictionary says that um, low self-worth is basically the absence of value. How many know that every one of us here has value? You, how many believe you have value? Amen. Jesus. How many believe you have value? Amen. Amen. Lord, help me. I think they didn't eat their Wheaties today. Oh, what you got? Look, pizza. Go get some pizza. And I'll ask in a little bit. And every, I should have a nice big amen that everybody in the, you know, whoever's going to see this video can hear the amens. How many believe they have value? Amen. 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 So what defines your self-worth, right? So let's look at that. Self-worth. It's how someone defines their value as worth as a person. And many people, many women, measure their value of self-worth on external factors. From body image, possessions to, possessions 
to acceptance from others and social standing. However, self-worth is about who you are and not what you have or what you do. Self-worth is who you are. And it's not about what you have or what you do or what your place is, social, economic status or ethnic background or, you know, it ain't got nothing to do with that. Self-worth, again, is about who you are, not what you do or what you have. Please make sure you write that nice and big. My value is not about who I am. It's not what I, what I do, excuse me, it's not about what I do and what I have. So looking for your worth as a person by comparing yourself with others, that's, a, that's, that's something we'll talk about in a little bit, <coughs> is always a losing battle and can have lasting negative effects. Can you repeat that, please? So looking for your worth as a person by comparing yourself with others will always be a losing battle. You'll never win. And it will have long-lasting negative effects. So every time you get on your little Facebook to see who's liking your page, to see if if you're better than you know, uh, uh, you know, you you're, you're you got a bunch of acquaintances because they're not your friends. You know, you got a bunch of acquaintances, and you step into their and you step into their site. And you see that they're posting, you know, that they're living all great and mighty and, and, and they never do wrong. And, and so you compare yourself to them like, man, I got to make myself look prettier so I can, I can look like the Joneses, right? Oh, I got to do this or I got to do that. No. And, you know, and, and so you begin a comparison with, with what's on Facebook, with, with what's. And what you don't understand is whoever's posting on Facebook are not always posting the truth. Because they're also trying to post a presentation that they ain't even living. They're posting they have it all together and they're insecure. And they got major security issues. They got major relationship issues. They got, I mean, they got all sorts of issues for their tissues. Tissues for the issues. And you're here too busy paying attention, comparing yourself because you're lacking. You're looking to be validated. You want worth, but you're looking for it in the wrong places. Have you heard that one song? Looking for love. Looking for love, looking for love in the wrong places. Okay, so, all right, let me, that's not my, that's not my gift. Saying is not my gift. All right, so real quick, I need help. Somebody find me Genesis 126. Somebody find me uh, Psalms chapter 139, verse 13 through 16. Who's got Genesis 126? I do. Okay, who's got Psalms 139, 13 and 16? Evelyn. Who's got Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 7? Marty, who's got John 10, 10? Okay, Stephanie, John 10, 10. You guys look for that. Well, Psalms 139, verse, what's the verse? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> verse 13 through 16. Why don't you let me read a whole verse? Just write it down. What was Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 7. All right, so again, Genesis 1, 26. Psalms chapter 139, verse 13 through 16. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 7. John 10, 10. <clears throat> God's word says that every human being has intrinsic value. Has intrinsic value. Value is given to all human beings because they have been created in the image and the likeness of God. Not because of what they do, not because of what they have, not because they're obedient, disobedient, not because they serve him or not serve him. Regardless of any of that, everyone has value. And we see that the, um, we see that the, the system that's up to date for abortion, right, the spirit of Molech, is, is just raving rampage against the Roe versus way and that abortion. Now it's to the point where there was the latest that I had heard was in Virginia, the governor approved of as soon as the baby's head is out, kill the baby, and that's okay. It's abortion. That can be approved. That's killing. That's killing. Murder. Murder. They say that a, a baby in the womb has no value because it does nothing. 
It doesn't have a heartbeat. It doesn't, it's just in there. So it's entitled to be killed. Really? So then how do you explain someone who goes into a coma? They're not doing anything, but they're laying there. Is that not the same thing? What about someone who is paralyzed and they're paralyzed from the neck down, not able to do anything? So do we have to murder all these people too because they're not doing nothing? Because they don't have no value? They're not making any contribution to our society? There is seriously a spirit of Moloch moving across the nation and it's getting worse and worse. Maybe we should go watch the movie Unplanned. Unplanned? Yeah, you heard about this movie? It's mm -mm. in the theaters right now. It's about the this lady. She was the director of the Planned Parenthood. Okay. And now she's a Christian. <coughs> she tells her story, and one of the things that she, I heard on, her on the radio and got my attention, she explained that the day that she finally realized what she was doing, she had to do a procedure. I think the lady was close to 12 weeks, Jesus. and they do did with um, ultrasound. So she saw the baby there. And they come with the needle and they they start sucking the baby out and she saw the she's like oh they say that the baby doesn't feel anything but by the procedure and by the ultrasound she could see that the baby was trying to move away from the needle and they pull the baby out and then from that moment on she Jesus she decided to quit burning. I haven't had the courage to go watch because they are advising for kids under seventeen has to be accompanied by the parents and has some graphic yeah. design to it. Right. Once in one, it's interesting seeing that. And since, and going and to since you're only 16, you can't go watch that movie on your Sorry. own. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but... <laughs> but, but <laughs> yeah, but I think it, it might be a good movie. So. Wow. And and this this should cause us a stirring within us. That it should cause us, because there's so much to pray about. This is something to pray about, right? We have to be praying for the unborn. We have to defend. They have nobody else to defend them. And if we don't defend them, then who? Actually, we have a client who's a paraplegic. He has zero movement in any of his body. He's got a little bit of movement on his right hand. So he uses that for a mouse oh. and for his wheelchair. Did I say kid because he's in his 20s. This kid runs a nonprofit. <sighs> and he raises funds for kids for St. Jude and for all kinds of other disabled kids. So instead of feeling sorry for himself or raising money for his own self, he does all of these events, taquisas, dances, um, all kinds of stuff from his wheelchair. It's just, it just blows mm -hmm, my mind. Mm -hmm. There's this other case, jo Joni, I think her name is Joni, I can't remember her name. She's got no limbs, none, but she paints with her, um, no, no limbs, she paints with her mouth wow. and she sells. She's, I mean, she's a guest speaker. She, I mean, so see, so what's our excuse? I sound okay. Let me go. All right, Genesis one twenty six. Who's got it? Me. Read it. And God said, "Let us make human beings in our image, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground." So let us create man in our own image and our likeness. Image and likeness. Image and likeness. And then, let us give them purpose. Let us give them dominion. If you want to find your purpose, you need to find your identity in Christ and have a relationship with God, and you will find what your purpose is. Because it's all connected. Your purpose is connected to your identity. Your identity is connected to Jesus Christ. We've been created with an image. We've been created with the likeness of God. Now, when Adam sinned, he lost the likeness and kept the image. The likeness is the area of morality, is the area of holiness, of righteousness. He lost it. He kept his personality. He still had his intellect. He still had emotions. He still had the image. But the likeness he lost. And that's why now Jesus Christ, the second Adam, thank you God for Jesus who opened up the way, now we can have that area of, of likeness restored, We not in its fullness, but as we awaken in our spirit man, as we have a relationship with God, as we begin to live in the spirit of God, in the spirit of holiness, in the spirit of righteousness, then our life 
it becomes to get in alignment and we begin to draw closer back to our likeness. The morality, something that this world has lost. Our morals. Hmm? And I could go on a tangent with that, but that's not, that's not today's lesson. Okay, so remember, created in the image and the likeness. Image. Image is something that's going to come right back up. So make sure you write it down. Image. Okay. Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16. You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside, and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvel marvel marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You've even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place. Hmm. Carefully, skillful, skillfully shaping me from nothing to something. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, who knows everything about us. He knows everything about you. There's nothing you can hide from him. He knows it. Right? So you only deceive yourself if you think you can hide that from him. Because he, he's the one that created you. He's the one that formed you, shaped you. He's the one that put all the sinews and muscles and, and he grew you within the secret place, that, that chamber of your mama's womb. It was God who was in control at that perfect moment. He knows everything about you. He knows every detail about you. He knows the strands, how many strands of hair you have. And he knows when 3,576 Point five fell off of you. The wonderful, amazing. What's that word he said? Wonder, wondrous. What? Marvelously <laughs> breathtaking. Marvelously breathtaking work of God. He formed us. He formed us. Yes, he used mama's little egg and dad's sperm, but it was God who, Holy Spirit, was the one forming us in our mama's womb. Oh, All there's right. There's a story that says that when the... There's the, the moment of conception. There's some light. That oh, absolutely. Out. Absolutely. I put that on band. Oh, well, it was there's, there's light that happens. I still remember. Electri <laughs> electricity. That's the Holy Spirit <laughs> giving life. Holy Spirit. It right there. Oof. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 7. The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you. In your mother's womb. Okay, stop right there for a moment. I'm sorry, I got to, because Jeremiah is one of my favorite. God has always ministered to me through that. So I have formed you even before I, what? I knew you. I knew you before I, I formed you. I formed you. I knew you already. So you were already in my heart. You were already in my mind. Before I then began to uh, form you, before I began to uh, create you, before I began to put my hands and develop you, I already had you here. I already had you from eternity. And then I knew that, uh, I knew perfectly that today, May 6th, I had two creatures that were going to be born, beautifully, <laughs> wonderfully made. We're about to give birth today. Your mama was, ah! right, pulling all y'all out. Okay. Huh? How old are you? How old are we? Oh, how old are we? Together? Oh, 15. Yeah, 15. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, read. <laughs> Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. <laughs> so see, remember when I told you that when you were in your mama's womb, God brings people, ministers of God, to talk to you, um, to talk to your mom and say, hey, your child is going to, you know, be a great asset in my kingdom. I'm going to use her. She's going to be my mouthpiece. I've separated her. I consecrated her from, from the time that you've been in the womb and you come out and all hell is breaking loose against you. And some of you here, let me look at here so nobody thinks I'm looking at them. You know, some of you have calling in the move of the prophetic. To move in the prophetic and the devil just come at you high water and all hell and I mean I, I so much violence so much violence in your mind so much violence 
in, in your emotions. I mean, he's he stripped you. He's trying to just, because he's trying, we're going to find out one of the verses that he's trying to kill you. Why? Because of what you carry. Because of what you carry. Go ahead. You're done. The, um, John 10, 10. Who's that, got John 10, 10? The thief comes only in order to steal and, and kill and destroy. Okay. So wait right there. The, there's a thief called the devil who's bringing hammers. And he's got punches. And he's coming with one objective. It is to do what three things? Steal, kill, and destroy. And so that is why you ask yourself, what the heck? I'm trying to serve God, and all of a sudden, I'm being found with so much opposition. All of a sudden, I'm losing my job, my finances, my relationship. I'm, what is going on here? It's like my life has been turned upside down. Because the main goal of this little booger here is to steal, destroy, and kill the very thing that God had put from way back when. When you were in your mama's womb. But, what does it say? I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. So Jesus Christ came and he came then to bring us life so that we can live in abundance. So that we can live in abundance. So that we can freely live. Right? So we have a war going on. Say there's a war. There's, there's a, a war. war. So, going back to the word of image, when, when you hear image, what comes to your mind? Picture. Another picture. picture. Ah, good. Okay. So, picture. What else? What you portray out to the world, your image, your style. Okay, so I'll put portray to the world. What else? Like a mirror. A mirror. Okay, what else? When you hear image, what comes to mind, Ali? Picture. <laughs> picture? Is the picture pretty, negative? It's um, rich, poor? What, what image? I mean, it could be anything. It could be anything. So, picture could be anything. Okay. Let me ask you something. What's the image you have of yourself? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Oh, I thought she said, okay. Oh. <laughs> what, what's the image that you carry about yourself? Okay? So I looked up um, image. Uh, Merriam's Web uh, Webster's definition says a vis visual representation of something. It's a picture or a photocopy. When God created us in his image, he's creating a mere image, a, a photocopy, a little mini me of him in us. It's, it's a mental picture or an impression of something. You're, you're taking the form of something or someone or you're taking an idea or a concept and now you're going to replicate it. Then I looked in the King James definition. It says a representation or, or um, simil I don't know how to say this word, si similitude, similar. It's like a similar of any person or thing formed of a material substance as an image wrought out of stone, wood, or wax. It can also be a statue. It can be an idol. An image can be an idol. Let's put that down because this is going to come up again. Idol. An idol, the representation of any person or thing that is an object of worship. Okay? Um, any copy, representation, or likeness. Like, the child is the image of its mother. Have you ever heard, oh my God, you look just like your mom and you talk like your mom and you do like stuff like your mom? Okay, well, it's a reality check. It's a, it's a semblance. There's a semblance there. It's an appearance. Oh my God, I know who, what family you're from, right? I'm like, how you know? You look like your mama. Like, Right? So, what can be the problem with our image? It can be distorted. It can be distorted. What else? It can be false. It can be false. Okay. Broken. It can be broken. Right? So.
according to what you read, Evelyn, mm -hmm. according to what you read, who read Genesis 126? According mm -hmm. to what you read, okay, and what um, Marty read, okay? Um, we were created in what? His image. So we were created in God's image, yes? Mm -hmm. I'm going to stick with image. Bear with me, please. We were created in God's image. And then what does Psalms 139 tell us? Just a few little attributes. We were what? Shaped? Formed. Uh, Innermost most being shaping my delicate inside and intricate outside. Wove them all together mothers in my mother's womb. Um, thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Okay. And then we were made complex. Okay. Marty, what did your verses say? That I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. Okay, hold on. So we were we were we were known before being formed in mother's womb. Mm -hmm. Before being formed in mother's womb. Before being formed in in mother's womb. Okay, and then we were what set, else? Set apart. Ah. Oops. Set apart. And what else? Appointed. Ah. So we were appointed. Appointed means what? We're given an assignment. We were given an assignment. Questions right now? Do you guys understand that right now? Mm -hmm. Do you guys understand right now what I just said about God's image? about us. So far you got it? Yes. Okay. We're going to get a little bit close here tonight. We're going to disclose a little bit. Okay? I want everybody to share. Start over here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you need to start sitting over here. I started over here a lot. Since I started over here, it's only logically I start over here. Okay? So, so. Wait, can you skip the birthday girls? <coughs> no, you guys are guests of honor today. We get to choose you. It's your birthday. It's your birthday. It's your birthday. Okay. So, I want you to give me one example of something that has affected you in your growing up years. Just one thing. One thing that has, that has, that, that is a punch. Tell me one thing that's a punch. Well. <laughs> I want you guys to start thinking. One thing that has been a punch in your growing up years. One thing. One thing that's been a punch mm -hmm. that affected me yep. when I grew up. Emotionally, psychologically, that it's just, it, it messes with you. And, and I'm going to tell you what, that what you say, most of all of us are experiencing that. All right, go. Marty, one thing. Think about it. One thing. Sexual abuse is an infant. Good. Good. Maritza. Uh, watching my mom be physically abused. Domestic violence. Mm -hmm. A day. It's a dysfunctional family. You want to get a little bit more? Give me one example of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that to explain a lot. What can I change that? Um, dysfunctional family, growing up fatherless. Fatherless. Okay. All right. So growing up without a father. Evelyn. Growing up uh, without a father, specifically uh, when I saw my dad leave um, and my parents got divorced. Okay. So divorce. Stephanie. Rejection within the own family. Rejection. I'm going to put from loved ones. Stephanie. Moving to another country. Oof. So would you say, um, uh, I'll put moving. Moving to another country. Um, Ale. Being in a very toxic and 
abusive not just physically but mentally and emotionally and sexually relationship at a very early yes young age. all right Lexi <laughs> Okay, that's good. Put down. Daniel, give me one thing from a male perspective, one thing that has affected you as you were growing up that messes with you. Verbal. <laughs> Verbal abuse in the environment. Yes. Actually, no. Inconsistency in the environment created by alcoholism in the environment, specifically. Minds, I'm going to put emotional abandonment and rejection. Look at all the punches. That was just one punch that every one of us named. Now imagine if we were here and I asked you, give me a list of 10 punches that you have received throughout your years, and we would receive here more than 100 punches. Overall, these punches have been launched at us, launched at the image, launched at the image. They have illegally trespassed to come and damage. How? I'm glad you asked. So the image that God gave me This is not too the image that God gave me, right? The image that I am being shaped, I'm formed. I've been woven together. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a creature. I'm a complex individual. So God made me unique, meaning nobody else has my fingerprints. Nobody else has my personality. There is not another Grizel in this world. There may be another Grizel that looks like me in other countries, but there is not another me. I am unique to my genetic DNA. I am unique the way God made me in my personality. So if you don't like me, oh well, too bad. Just kidding. <clears throat> I am who I am because this is how God created me to be. He, he has from from the womb of my mom, and I say this to you because many times there's been many pastors who have confirmed from different places the same word, the same word, the same word. I have separated you. I have consecrated you from your mama's womb. I have a purpose in your life. So, so the fact that I already carry purpose in me, and every one of you guys carries purpose. You're not here for a coincidence. You're here because God is coming here to heal and deliver you, to bring you to and position you, align you to your calling, to your purpose. What he is a place in you so that it can surface and it begins to manifest and the world is better placed because what God is placing you is now you're able to use it because the gift that God gave you is not for you. It's to establish the kingdom of God here on earth by blessing, by ministering, by edifying and helping others that where you once were, now you turn around and you help them out of the grudge. You help them out of the mess. You bring them from the darkness into the light. Does that make sense so far? Am I speaking to anybody in this house? Amen. The image that God has initially gave me now is being assaulted by an enemy. It's being assaulted because he comes to kill, to destroy, and to rob the very thing that God has given to you freely from the very get-go. I have called you. I have consecrated. 
consecrated you. I have separated you. I have a calling. I have something so great. I deposited in you. So the devil comes to say, oh no, this is not going to happen. Because the thing is that this person, if she ever reaches her potential, if she ever comes into her position and calling, I'm in trouble. My kingdom is in trouble. And some of you guys have callings to preach the word of God. Just and, and, and God already gave you sermons. Just in case you didn't know. That's your birthday gift. And some of you have callings in the prophetic and you have no idea. And some of you guys going to take you into some realms of the spirit because he's going to use you like you've never seen before and your family doesn't even know who you are when you come into that position. And you will be a witness to your family that what your mama didn't reach, you will reach and your generations will reach. And God will use you to bring salvation to all your generations. But you have an enemy who has illegally come in from when you were in your mama's womb. Right in there that you were, right in that nice little comfort creature place. That probably you didn't want to come out after nine months. Because it's a free, it's a free haven. You're being nurtured. But the problem is that the devil couldn't get you, so he got to your mom. Jabez. So he got to your mom. He got to your mom by speaking some things into existence. So that when, when you were then birthed out, then the enemy really was bringing, and what is he doing? What was the enemy doing? So he takes and he says, okay, this young lady has an image in her. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this image, I got to distort it. I got to distort the image. I got to uh, uh, make sure that she is not aware who she is. I got to make sure that she doesn't know that she belongs to me. That I, that I got to make sure that she understands that God is not her father. So I'm going to set in motion. So I'm going to have her only mind. I'm going to call some things. So there's division in the home. So that way then you grow up without a father. Not knowing who you are. Not being validated. Not being esteemed. Not being nurtured. Not being loved and embraced. And you're walking around wondering, who am I? So, so the enemy comes in and says, I'm going to try to break that image. I cannot have her connected with God. But see, see, the devil is a liar. See, the devil, the devil thinks he's got a plan and God's got a bigger plan greater than him because he takes you out of Portugal. He takes you out of Brazil, brings you all the way to Mana Doña Corina's house where then he sits in motion, my husband, to deal with me about going and giving Bible studies. And I didn't want to hear, the Lord brings me right to you. And then he uses you to confirm to me a word that God had placed in him, placed in me to bring into reality the kingdom of God. And here we are today, ladies at Deep Waters Women's Ministry. So don't tell me the devil thinks he got away with something. He didn't. He didn't. Every time. He comes in to set a plan in motion. God will overturn it. God will overturn it. But he's, he set some things in there. He has set. S-E-T. He set some things. He's embedded some, some lies in your mind about who you are. That you are not unworthy. That you are not dirty. That what God has spoken to you will come to pass. But see, those things that have been embedded come up and they rise up and they come against the very knowledge of God and there's a struggle there. I'm not worthy. I'm dirty. I, I just failed you way too many times. I don't think I... And so these things come and they battle in there. Why? Because... He set up a stronghold. He's, he's, he's done a job. He's sneaky. The Bible says he's coming. The Bible says the enemy is, and I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. He's cunning. He's crafty. If he was able to deceive Eve, how much more us? He's a deceiver. He laces truths and he laces them up with lies. So that way you bake to the light and you, the truth you never reach. And he tries to deceive us constantly. So he brings into our image <coughs> a false image. 
He brings into us, he embeds in us a false lie. He, he, he embeds in us a false uh, just lies and, and statements that seem to be true, but they're really not. And what they do is they've twisted. And remember, we spoke about the, the, the Leviathan spirit. It comes to twist, to, to, to contort, to distort, to uh, make dysfunctional that which was uh, in order. And we see that God is a God of order, and here we have dysfunction. That's why when God brings us, and we begin to really get into his word, and we begin to really do his will, there's areas of our life that are in dysfunction, and we have problem with order. And when God's order is trying to align us, he's trying to position us so that he can have access to heal, restore that, and take out what is twisted, and take out what, what has been deeply rooted in us by a false image, we have an issue with it. Because like you had said, the only way to get that out is by what? Grinding, Grinding it. And the only way the clay gets molded, sometimes the potter has to use, I don't know how to say it in English, aliha. It's a, a tool that it's to cut the hard areas, it's to soften the clay. And sometimes it has to crumble in certain areas for it to be redone. And we find ourselves, huh? Sandpaper. It's, it's a, but it's not sandpaper, it's a, it's a wire. It's a wire that he uses, right? And there's different grades of wire. And sometimes he has to put us through a process, right? To grind us, grind us in some areas that become so hard. Why? Because there's some images there that should not belong there. And he's got to get them out because where he's taking us, there is no room for those things. They, they have no value. They, they are there to limit us, to distract us, to detain us, to put a weight on us. Is somebody receiving something here tonight? Mm -hmm. so, so there is a negative in, in the brain, in the image, the, the heart. Uh, our, 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 in our soul area, in the area of our thoughts, in the area of our, of our emotions, in the area of our will, there has been things that have been embedded from way back when that we don't even have an idea. Sometimes we're so unaware of it. But thank you, Jesus, for Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for Holy Spirit, who does the searching ministry. That when we give Holy Spirit an opportunity, he'll bring things up to surface. Sometimes when he brings you to a teaching ministry where he's going to give you the word. How many know that the Bible is likened unto a hammer that breaks the rock in two? That is what God's word says. That his word is likened unto a hammer. A powerful hammer. Yeah, the devil may have had a hammer, but God has one who is just righteous and powerful and able to break whatever is stony in our life. It's He's got the power to break it. The Bible tells me in the book of Hebrews that the word of God is likened unto a double-edged sword. A double-edged sword. It cuts going in and it cuts coming out. <laughs> It cuts going in and it cuts coming out. It's a double as short. It comes, it goes so deep, so deep that it's able to divide the spirit and the soul. And so he'll bring you under a teaching ministry. It's not, and, and there's different types of ministries out there for different types of need. But this one in particular is a healing and deliverance ministry. So the teaching you receive, how many know that the word of God has the capacity to bring deliverance? Amen. How many know that the word of God has the capacity to heal, Amen. to renew and transform? Amen. So he brings you under a teaching ministry that's going to bring you teaching, that's going to confront you, that's going to show you some areas of your blind spots. Have you ever been riding on a highway and there's a, maybe a truck right by you? And if you like ride a little bit on the side of it, you all of a sudden see that, oh my God, this truck's getting right closer. I don't think he even sees me. The truck has a blind spot. And if you perfectly are positioned there, you will not see the car that is there because it's so huge. And sometimes we have blind spots in our lives. So God brings us coverings to, to show us these blind spots. What you don't see, well, I'm going to bring someone, I'm going to show it to you. That's his love for us, his mercy for us. 
So really quick, when a negative self-belief becomes truth in your mind, <coughs> it becomes a pattern of thinking, negative thinking. So basically, I did a little fortress here, right? Is that what it looks like, a little fortress? Mm -hmm. A little stronghold, you know, back in the day, you know, there was warfare. There was men up here with, with arrows, right? And they were literally to try to get in. How many of y'all watched the movie, um, the... Um, the Twin Towers of the, the Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a warfare movie, but it's also, it's got a lot of biblical, um, it's, it's, it's got a lot of symbolism, uh, religious symbolism and stuff about, it's, there's a war. There's a war between the light and the darkness, right? And so they use a battering ram. They use, they have uh, tons of armies, right? These overgrown creatures. I mean, it's so demonic. And they're coming to batter the door. They're battering the door. If they can get in through the door, they will be able to seize the compound. And so that is what happens is that when our image has been breached, when our image, our life from when we were little, there's been lies embedded into our mind. What happens is that the enemy is breached through the door. He's gotten in. And he's established some base of operation. He's established some base of operation within the deep crevices of our thoughts. And that's what you call a mental stronghold. So, again, when we have negative self-belief, that's why we can't believe, uh, oh, no, God can't love me. Look, I'm dirty. No, I've had this. I had, No, I just... I tr okay, yeah, I know God loves me, but do you really believe it at the core of your spirit that God truly loves you, that you are his and he is yours? Do you truly believe it? And oftentimes we speak one thing that we believe it, but in our, in our whole lifestyle shows that we don't believe it. So you said when, can you repeat that, when we have negative self? Negative self-beliefs. Those are, those are, we have, we have these, 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 False, these are false beliefs that become true to us. To us, they're true. I can tell you, those are the lies of the enemy. And you're like, no. You know, you justify, you rationalize. You're like, you, ju you just defend why that's there. Right? And, and, and it becomes your truth. Oh, that's just me. Where are you at? I'm, I'm going to go up there, oh. but I'm saying, oh, that's just so me. It, it in develops, our own minds. Yes. In our own minds. Oh, that's just me. That's just how I am. That's just how I'm. I, Untrue. I'll never change. Right? Is another one. This is how I've always been. You have to take me or to leave it. Like, oh, okay. well, Negative self belief. Right? Is 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 a mindset. Is a way of thinking. It's it's a. I'm unloved. When we have negative self beliefs, they become true to us. Those are the lies of the enemy. So it becomes a, a pattern of thinking. And when it's a pattern of thinking, that means that there's some mental strongholds. Okay? So it's a negative opinion, a negative opinion that becomes regarded as truth. And the problem, the problem with this, why, why is it such a problem? Why, why is that such a problem? Why is mental stronghold such a problem? When we serve God with our mind. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's, I mean, if we have a stronghold there, I think it just affects everything else. Okay, okay. Anybody else? What? Why is having a mental stronghold a problem? Because someone can be telling you something positive about yourself, but you'll never believe it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's okay. blocking so, a stronghold in our minds is a spiritual fortress. You don't see it, but it's there. It's a spiritual fortress. And it's made of wrong thoughts. It's, it's a fortified dwelling place where demonic forces hide. And then from there, they operate in power 
against us. They operate from this base to really work against us. And I'll explain to you in just a minute how. So the ideas and thoughts that make up a stronghold are based on lies that challenge the truth of God. What he has revealed about himself will have a problem with it. Have you ever had a problem that you just like, no, that can't be true. No, that just, you, you just, you, or sometimes you're like, how many, like I've explained it different ways. I've layered it. I, I mean, I broke it down and stuff and you still can't grasp it because within you, there is a stronghold that's not allowing you to receive truth. This is the problem. So I said the stronghold is a spiritual fortress. It, Satan uses it as a place of operation against us, okay, to keep us from the true knowledge of God, to keep us from the true knowledge of God. Find me Colossians chapter 3 verse 10. It, and, and it's there to keep us from hearing, from, from, from having an enjoyable relationship with God. So he builds that stronghold, that base of operation, and then he begins to send lies. This is all happening within the soul, people. He begins to develop and send out wrong ideas. What does Colossians 3.10 say? Technical difficulty. Oh, you have technical difficulties? <laughs> begins to develop and what? I'm sorry, what was the last point? Wrong ideas. He, he keeps us from having a, uh, or developing an enjoyable relationship with God. We're not able to reach that. Uh, keep us from the true knowledge of God. No? Uh, develop something. Develop wrong ideas. Did I say that? He develops, so, so from his base of operation, he develops wrong ideas and then he sends them against us. And then the thing is that when we have a problem with our image, we don't know how to discern. Yesterday, oh my God, Jesus, my mom just got down with one of them sermons. I was like, oh Lord Jesus. She was just on fire, people. Yeah. On fire. Sure. On fire. God was speaking <laughs> and the belt was out. Mm -hmm. The belt, mira, huacate, huacate. No holding back. And she talked about how she used the, the ten virgins. She talked about the five foolish and the five uh, prudent. Mm -hmm. She talked about the lamps and she talked about the garments. Mm -hmm. The garments. Y'all better have your garments ready for the wedding. Because if you don't have a garment ready, you're not going into the wedding feast. You better make sure that you have sufficient oil in your lamp. Oil represents Holy Spirit. Better make sure. Uh, the lamp also represents is the word of God. Make sure that you're getting sufficient word. The word brings light. The word of God brings light in the inward parts. And when the light comes in, the darkness has to go. So some of us have some problems in our image that the word of God has to get into and remodel and reform and renew. So that that way then, this gets teared down and God, God's own, the only hold that we have on us is the hold of God. And we start really thinking, speaking, and living way differently. Living the way God had initially from our mama's womb had created us and formed us to be. What does it say? Uh, 310, right? 310. For you have acquired a new creation, life which is continually being renewed renewed into the likeness of the one who created you giving you the full revelation of God so in other words put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge of Jesus Christ so we need to put on the new man okay put on the new man who is renewed our minds have to be renewed if we if we think about if we think about strongholds if we think about uh, re having our minds renewed, what two verses, what two, what two scripture portions should come to your mind right away? And where do you find that one at? Come on, girl. Come on, preacher girl. Come on, preacher girl. You know it. It's there. Yes. Second Corinthians. 
chapter 4, verse 10. Chapter 10, uh -huh, verse 4 and 5, right? So what does this C say? Capture those thoughts that are not, that are being launched from this place. Capture them, tear them down. And you put God's word in place. CC. You capture those evil, wrong ideas. Hey. Look at that good looking guy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm single so I can go give him my number, you know. And, and he, it, he don't even serve the Lord. Oh, look. Five finger discount. Nobody's watching. I can take that. <coughs> Thoughts that come into our mind. Hey, get in the internet. See what's happening with so-and-so. Follow her. Let's see. Let's see. So you can go gossip about her. Yeah. Who does she think she is? You know. I'm, I'm just bringing up thoughts that we have to face on a daily basis. These wrong thoughts come into our mind from a base of operation. That needs to be destroyed, but we have to capture, the Bible says, capture and cast them out. What's another verse that talks about renewal of the mind? What's another Bible verse that I speak of all the time? I'll give you a hint. It's about Apostle Paul. The book starts with an R. Romans? Yes! Romans! No, that one's that, one's that, that all things work according to those... I'm talking about the one of renewal of the mind and the transformation and the holy and acceptable and, 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 and living sacrifice, which is the one I always use. That one verse that you... You got use. it! I'm Marty got it. it. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, right? And it talks about that we must renew our minds. We need to transform. We cannot be content. We cannot just uh, uh, be in the familiar we can't always be in the routine of the same old, same old. God is not the same old. He changes. Although the Bible says he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, but he will not leave you in the same old, same old. He is a God who transforms and transcends. Right? So again, the ideas and thoughts that make up the stronghold are based on lies that challenge the truth of what God has revealed about himself. So the devil, this little liar, rebuke him in the name of Jesus, doesn't want you to develop a relationship or know your heavenly father. He doesn't want you to come to the knowledge of who you are in Christ and the purpose that God has placed in you. He doesn't want that. So he destroys and he begins to embed in your image from early on to so you can live a dysfunctional life. Is that what God has called us to? No. So he attacks your worth. First, he attacks your self-esteem, your, your, your security, I'm going to disappear it. I'm going to dysfunctionalize it. I'm going to distort it so you can be insecure. Is that what God has called us to be insecure? No. He's called us to be secure. And then if I don't, I can't attack that, then I'm going to attack your worth. That you're unworthy. You're worthless. You're, you're caca. You don't, you're not worth nothing. You, you just doo-doo. You're just like dung. You're, yeah, I just got to make it out clear. Because some of us carry ourselves like that. Like we don't, we're not worth nothing. When God has said, value in us. So how does this translate in our life? What does that look like? How does this manifest in our life? What does it look like when I don't love myself? When I don't love others? When I can't accept myself or who I am? Well, how does that, what does it look like? Y'all want to know? Okay, thank you for asking. So this can engage, um, this can translate or manifest in our lives as engaging in self-destructive behaviors. Do y'all know self-destructive behaviors? Name me one, Maritza. <sighs> Speaking negatively about yourself. About okay, time. okay. Self destructive behavior, name me one. Um, I don't know, feeling unworthy. What does that look like? Yeah. Um, oh, come on. You, you gave us a testimony one time at a hotel. Remember? Yeah, that Wait. was self destructive. Oh, like cutting yourself? In yeah, place? okay. So <laughs> self mutilation. Oh, good job. Good job, right? What else is a self destructive behavior? Sleeping around. Good one. Drinking. You're sleeping around. That's self-destructive, huh? Drinking, smoking. Drinking, smoking. Woo! All right. Now we're getting somewhere. All right. So engaging in self-destructive behavior. These are behaviors that causes you harm. It's basically called a dysfunctional coping mechanism. It's a dysfunctional coping mechanism. And we do it. All the time, sometimes without noticing. And, and you're going to find yourself, you're going to be like, 
So I'm not going to look at nobody. Just in case I hear, if y'all laugh out loud, then you're giving yourself up. But I'm not calling anybody out. Okay, so when there is self-rejection, we fear ridicule and condemnation. So we continue to strive for perfection. Mm -hmm. And what happens if perfection is not obtained? That's what we do. Well, the next step is we begin to curse ourselves. We speak curses of condemnation over ourselves over and over again. And it brings in the spirit of self-destruction so much so that, that what does the self-destruction look like? It, it's the act of, of it's it is the act or process of destroying oneself, and it sets us up for a spirit of infirmity. We begin to have all sorts of maladies. And infirmity is a sickness, and 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 you know it's one thing after another after another, and it's like we're always sick. What does it look like? Toxic relationships. Y'all know what toxic relationships are? Mm -hmm. Okay. Toxic relationship that only confirm to us that we truly are unworthy. Mm. Have you ever seen or have you ever asked yourself a woman comes out of a domestic violence situation only to get into another domestic violence situation? Or, or she goes back to the person who's hurting and harming her. Have you ever saw that? Have you ever seen that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or it may also show up as you isolate yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> isolate yourself. You ignore even self-care. You, you don't care about your environment, meaning your household. You don't vacuum. You don't take garbage out. The dishes are stacking up. There's garbage everywhere. You don't even groom yourself. You don't even bathe, only unless you're going to cover up and, and you're going to put up the appearance, and then you'll you'll take care of yourself. But everything else is down. And you don't care. Everything is just there's no there's no caring for yourself. You don't even make it to the doctor. That reminds me of the TV show, the hoarding oh hoarders. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's so you can even you can even deny the self care, such as you don't get enough sleep. And you don't just go to the doctor for preventative care. And so the problem here is that when you're struggling with that low self-worth, with, with those thoughts of worthlessness, that you're just unworthy, you just, you're just doo-doo, right? We can easily, without noticing, slip into a cycle of self-hate. Mm, mm, mm. Self-hate. What self-hate? That's explanatory. I hate myself. It's the opposite of love. The Bible says love God above all and love your neighbor as you love. Yourself. As you love. Yourself. So we're supposed to love ourselves as we love our neighbor. Don't go into extremes. Some of us love ourselves too much and we forget about our neighbor. It's a balance. All balance, right? And so when we go into a cycle of self-hate, we see it through destructive thoughts. And often these trigger self-destructive behaviors. Again, low self-esteem, uh, or a bad self-image. Um, and no matter what the term we use, self-hate is a self-worth problem. So if you're having a problem with self-worth, you're going to be hating on yourself. You know how the term is, don't be hating, right? So I'm telling you, don't be hating yourself. Don't do that. And so oftentimes, also, remember when I said about isolation? People feel alone. They can be in a room with a bunch of people, but they are literally alone. They're, they're lonely. And they'll express it to somebody of confidence. I feel really lonely. And I'm like, but you got family here. No, it's just this inner conflict that's going on. And self-worth then isn't just an emotional issue. It's a mind issue. It's a mind issue. Why? You're dealing with thoughts of negative, of, uh, negative self-worth. Again, we're going back to the image. We're going back to the image. And then what happens is that these, it's a, a cycle that just down spirals into activities such as uh, it, it depression, uh, eating disorders, cutting, self-injury, or even suicide. And so, <clears throat> uh, again, when we're dealing with the thoughts of, ne uh, it's a mind issue, when we're having all these negative thoughts, right? Again, remember that Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is. So is. So is. Okay, 
So as a man thinketh in his heart, the heart is what? Your mind. Your soul. What? Your mind. <laughs> Somebody help the day out. Emotions. Your emotions. Will. And the will. So these three areas that consist of the soul, something has illegally trespassed, and we see that then Satan has gotten in, and he seated, he seated, he seated false beliefs, false beliefs. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, in the Gospels, that a farmer went out, and this is the Griselle version, okay? A farmer went out, and he went and sold some uh, cilantro, Ha! He sold a bunch of seeds of cilantro, and then when he got up the next day, there wasn't only cilantro, but there was cilantro with a bunch of dandelion weeds in there. And he says, what happened to my crop? I only sold one seed. Ah, but that's the key of the parable is to show you that at nighttime, at nighttime, the, the pastor talked that at midnight is talking about a season of midnight, a season of darkness, a season where the enemy comes to plant, to sow, and he doesn't just sow uh, beautiful plants, he sows tares, he sows uh, false beliefs, where does he sow them? In us. In our brains, in our minds, in our soul, from our image, from when we were very little. Since we were a little, little bitty seed in our mama's womb, he's been sowing some stuff. Illegal trespassing. And now we're wondering, why am I thinking like this? Why do I have this problem? Why do I have some strong? I'm still going, you know, that one sin that always gets you? You're like, man, I, I, I've got victory. I've done this, I've done that. And then all of a sudden, boom, the same sin comes back. You're like, I thought I had victory over it. Ah. When you see it, a pattern of it coming, surfacing up again and again. It could be anger. It could be bitterness, unforgiveness, hmm? jealousy, envy, uh, insecurity, uh, unloved, dirtiness, unworthiness. What's coming up constantly? What's tripping you up in being able to go forward in the Lord? Ah, maybe it's procrastination. We'll deal with that next week. <clears throat> Let me keep going. As a man thinketh in his mind, so is. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, again, we, uh, what starts out as a negative internal thought process, it's an internal work. It's an internal work. What you see on the outside is only a little bit a cusp of the tip of the iceberg of what's happening inside, right? And it can quickly turn into a pattern of self-hate that impacts every area of your life. And let me tell you what, this right here, as well as insecurity, will definitely destroy your relationships. It will destroy your relationships. You'll go from relationship to relationship to relationship. And God is all about fellowship and community. God is all about loving one another. So here at Deep Waters, that's why I have to work really hard. I have to work really hard. I remember I told one of you guys. And I'm like, I've been praying, and I'm like, Lord, I'm doing what you're asking me to do, but they're responding differently. I don't know what else to do. So I pray, and I'm praying. And I'm like, Lord, you got to break this. And it's that trying to keep the community, the fellowship, the conversation, dialogue between one another, that this is a family. But the problem is when we have some issues going on in our life that stem from a negative self-image, there's been things that's been embedded in us. It doesn't allow us to enjoy what God has ordained and established, which is what? Fellowship, community, relationship. We have issues in those areas. Questions right now. Are you getting something? Amen. Amen. So what happens when you put your worth on external factors? What happens? What do you think happens? When you put your worth on something else other than Christ, what happens? You're let down. You're let down. What else happens? And what does that lead to? Disappointment. What? Disappointment. Disappointment. What else? Self-hate. Self-hate? Okay. Well, like, you know, you get... <laughs> okay, somebody help Evelyn out. <laughs> I was thinking, yeah... I was thinking like you, you, give, you up. give up, okay? You feel depleted. You feel depleted? Yeah. Okay. So then when another relationship comes, you're remembering that relationship, and you think that that new relationship is going to be the same as the old, yes? yes? Come on now, come on now. And right away, your mind starts to play those tricks, and from here, the fortress, whoo, all sorts of arrows of lies. 
They're going to be the same way. They're going to, you can't trust them. They're going to mess you up. Man, don't, you can't even, you know, they're probably going to gossip on you. They don't really love you. Man, they're just making it up. Look, they're not, they're just being nice because they're just being courteous, but they really don't love you. All of these things start, yes or no? Mm -hmm. What does that do to us? What does that do to us? Causes us to shut down. Causes us to shut down. What else? It makes us insecure. Insecure. What else? Puts us back into that cycle. Fear! Fear shows up! The big monster of fear! All the bells and whistles are blowing left and right. You can't trust, you can't trust, can't believe, you can't. Don't open up, don't this, don't that, right? All of this. And what does it do to you? You guys you yourself up. Hmm? You guys yourself You set up a guard. And you're not able to fellowship. You're not able to enjoy what God has brought you to. You're not able to enjoy what God has brought you to. He's brought you to a blessing, but because of your past and all of this that's going on in your mind, you're not able to receive. And, and the blessing skips right by you because you really believe what's been in your past. It's a stronghold. Say it's got to be broken. It's got to be broken. So, again, when I am putting my worth on external factors... I have a distorted, distorted view of my own value as a person. Feelings of not being good enough. I'm unloved. I'm incompetent. I have a problem, Grizel. I cannot stop comparing myself with others. I avoid people or activities like social gatherings. No, because people are going to be looking at me. No, because... They're always, they always want to come and talk to me. I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want them to know me, right? Because I have a negative self-perception. So I have high critical thoughts of myself. How many, how many here can truly say, right, at one time, uh, you know, that we've been so critical of ourselves that we've just done spoken and really, like, kicked ourselves in the rear end and really bad, right, the way we shouldn't? Okay, now, how many are learning and how many are working towards being gentle to yourself and loving yourself? Thank you, Jesus. We're getting somewhere, Lord. But we can become very judgmental towards other and ourself. And so when we base our self-worth on external factors, such as uh, maybe if I'm in school, I got to be the 4.0 student. I got to have all A's. I have to, like, be the top, right? So it's all about performance, performance, performance. It comes from perfection. Uh, the appearance. I got to... I got to look pleasing so everybody will accept me, right? And all that does, all these little things that, that we do, it, it causes more stress. It builds anger within us. It affects, even if we're in school, it affects our academic progress. And not only that, but then if it's in church setting, it destroys and it hinders our being able to relate one with another. So again, where do these stem from? From childhood. One of the major ones is when we have critical parents who have criticized us, who have spoken to us, or who have spoken negative messages to us. Has anybody here ever experienced a parent speaking negative of you? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Or maybe we learned that love was conditional. Has anybody here learned, learned that love was conditional? Oh, let me give you an example. So I need to earn love by being good doing my chores, getting good grades. It becomes a performance and a work base. So I love you. If you do, if you do what is good, I reward you. I show you. Also, you get the, you start getting the image. You get the message that if I do the good stuff, I'm always loved. The minute that I do something wrong, boom, I get a whooping. Well, you know, some of us Spanish Latinos, we got a chancla, right? Chancla. <laughs> Huh? A chancla. A chancla. You got anything nearby? <laughs> anything nearby? I never wonder if there's any other culture which the moms doesn't have this, this sayings or this way of behaving with their kids. Uh -huh. Because like you guys are Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Brazilians, the moms do the same, and I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder is there a culture where the moms are not like that? I don't know. Is there a culture in the American culture, Dan? That the moms don't uh, yeah, hit their children or, or you don't know, say, like, they don't keep saying, they don't, you know, like, uh, criticize their criticize children or hit them with a chunk yeah. or the belt or something. How do you grow up? Did you get spanked? They get a time off, don't they? Ale says that you get a time out. <laughs> You got the belt? I got the belt. Oh, he got the belt. Oh, Sorry, don't say not for him. That that breaks that that paradigm right there. I mean, I'm laying on the bed 
with the belt across your bare back. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. What about a wet belt? <coughs> I never had that, but I had uh, velvet poles in it. Ooh. Got it. <laughs> Okay, I had a chunk out that was made of wood. Okay. okay, so so we 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 begin to learn that love is conditional. We begin to learn, okay, that it's a work base. I have to perform, and if we're not careful, as we go into adulthood, we become where it's dysfunctional. It's it's an image problem. It's it's a it's a belief. Uh, problem that we think that I have to do this in order to be accepted, to be loved. When God says, you don't have to do anything, just you are who you are because I created you and I love you just the way you are. But we don't believe that. Why? Because we have a problem with some str mental strongholds. So God has to work in that. The thing is that we come into believing, we even come into church, we come and give our hearts to Christ, we begin to grow within the church, and we still have this mindset that we have to work, we have to do something, we have to, you know, to earn God's love, to earn forgiveness, and we are a work-based mentality that enters into religiosity. We enter into legalism without even noticing we're living a life we say we're Christians, we love the Lord, and we have a relationship, but it's a limitation because we're still in a work-based performance. Yes, ma'am? Um, in the family violence class that I took, uh, we went into relationships, mm -hmm. and in the book, it had different relationships and why people stay in, say, abusive relationships, yeah. dysfunctional relationships. There's the one, there's the one who's the provider. You can't leave them because you cannot provide for yourself. Or you have kids and you yes. can't leave. Right. Or it's a give and take. Mm. It's a, I love you if you do this. Mm. And there were different types of dysfunctions of why people stay together. So. Absolutely. And it's, and, it's, and it's prevalent today more than ever. We see that. Right? So, again, it's a mind thing, too. There's things that people have been conditioned. You know that a man, let's say a woman can be violent, too. There's women who have beat down their husbands, and their husbands are like, you know, no, I can't, no. You know, a woman can be very evil, too. So this, is, this goes to both ways. But the problem is that the abuse is so much that it conditions you. That's where the this mental strongholds are developed. And the woman has to really receive counseling. Has, she needs the Lord and the Word of God in order to be able to be built back up and be freed from that. Okay, because we can become conditioned. And that's what I'm talking about here is that love is conditional. We learn that we have to do stuff in order to receive it. And that's not true at all. Okay, uh, so when we come to Christ, this mindset is still so strong in us. Again, it can cause us to live a life of not a freedom, but legalism. Um, because we believe we have to do stuff in order to receive forgiveness, in order to receive the love of the Lord. When, when Holy Spirit... He has to really illuminate us. He has to open the eyes of our understanding for us to grasp. And really, it's a conviction. It's a, it's a belief in the core of our spirit that we just know that we're forgiven when we confess because that's what the Bible says. And also that because I'm created in the image and the likeness of God, I have value. I am loved. As a matter of fact, God demonstrated through his son at the cross of Calvary, John 3, 16. So anything that is learned can be unlearned. Anything that is learned can be unlearned. So if you have some do learning as you're growing up, guess what? You can unlearn it. And that's what Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 is all about. Unworthiness. When I'm feeling like I'm not good enough. When I'm, no, God can't love me. No, I just, nobody accepts me. Nobody, when we, that right there can also be uh, unbelief in disguise. Remember we're talking about unbelief and doubt? We can literally have unbelief in our life. Remember that unbelief is a condition. It's a state of being. It's, it's a refusal to believe a truth that's been given to you and you refuse to accept it. Well, doubt, doubt, I struggle. I have questions about my faith. I have questions that uh, I don't have real confidence in and I'm kind of like stuck within, within the uh, crossroads not knowing sure which way to go, right? But the p problem is with unworthiness, with the feeling of, of worthlessness is that it's a form of unbelief. 
It, it, because why? It's a belief that you are not personally worthy to receive the love of God. So you cannot receive all he has for you. And some of us struggle in this area. And oftentimes, remember last week. Remember that what I ended with last week. Last week I said, when the truth has been given to you, when God has been ministering to you, and Holy Spirit is bringing this to your attention, and you still refuse to receive the truth of God's word. The problem is not that. It's really unbelief. It's really an image problem. Problem. It's really an idol problem. So, so in this image, I developed an idol. I have now a new image, a false image, an idol image that I look to, that I believe, that I hold on to, and the Lord says, that needs to be teared down. So, again, unworthiness or un, um, low self-worth or no worth at all, it can be unbelief in disguise. So some of the some of the signs of unworthiness in a person, when you see somebody that doesn't, they have low self-worth and they just, you know, what we've been talking about, uh, it's hard for them to ask for help. Remember we talked about that insecurity? It's hard for them, remember we talked about insecurity, the two extremes of pride, okay? It's hard for them to ask for what they need. Uh, and in most forms uh, of unworthiness, we can see in procrastination or self-sabotage. Right? Uh, we refuse to improve our lifestyle. Okay? <coughs> uh, we are too busy comparing ourselves with others. Uh, and oft oftentimes, it's, I don't even know who I am. I don't have identity. There's problems with my identity. I just don't know. Like, I can ask you, you know, who are you? And some of us, oh, uh, give me a description of what you do. No, that's not who you are who you are, your identity, who you are in Christ. And so when we displace our God-given identity, the result will often be a sense of worthlessness. If my identity is on anything or anyone other than Jesus Christ, and that variable, like you had mentioned earlier, if it changes, then I will experience a negative emotion of worthlessness. Okay? So how do we deal with this unclean, ravenous vulture that wants to consume my sacrifice? Number one, we need to feed our faith. I need to feed my faith. That means I must get in the Word. I must get into the Word. I have to find scripture that talks about the very thing that negatively assaults my mind and emotions. That means that when, when I know that there's mental strongholds, that they have, there's patterns of thinking that have been embedded in my image. That means I have to turn to the word of the God, of God, the word of the Lord. That's the only place that I can receive truth. To there has to be an exchange. I let go of the false image and I bring in the truth of God's word. I must, I must, I must grow my relationship with God. I got to grow. Excuse me, my relationship with God, not with my buddy, not with my BFF. Not with the leader, not with my mom, not with my dad. No, with God. He is your only true source for security and worth. He is your only true source for security and worth. Another thing, we talked about work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Working out your salvation means that I'm going to evaluate, I'm going to identify, and I'm going to destroy any hidden false belief systems that are in my mind. I'm going to evaluate, I'm going to identify, and I'm going to destroy any and all hidden belief systems. And I will renew them with what? Nothing but the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Not only will I just do that, I must speak the Word of God to my life. I got to declare the Word of God. So, if the devil's hitting me with low self-worth, that I, I don't ni sirvo para llevar peros a, a to go to the bathroom, and that keeps stemming up, that nobody loves me, that, you know, I'm rejected, you know, and so guess what? Then I need to go into scripture. I need to find me some verses. I not only have to come to the Lord and talk to him about it, I now need to speak to myself and say, devil, you're a liar. You're telling me this and this and that, because anything... How do I know? How do I know when something is from the devil and when it's from God? Well, first of all, anything that gives you a negative emotion, anything that would have you look at somebody else in a negative way, that's not from God. 
Because God doesn't add that to you. And it's okay? not a good report. And the problem is, the problem is some of us walk in the prophetic. As we're growing in the Lord, some of us are beginning to awaken certain, uh, certain giftings in our life. And we begin to discern and we begin to see more than the usual person. And, and the problem here is that if we don't get this image thing taken care of, we will end up uh, uh, rejecting the, the sinner with all his sin. And we can't even love the person. We condemn instead of build, edify, and love. So it becomes a problem. Because let me tell you what. What God has called you to be, who he has called you and destined you to be, is not going to be forgotten. It's not going to just, it's not going to happen. That's going to be activated in you, but you use it wrongly. We need to surrender. Surrender. Say, I need to surrender. I need to surrender. What? Oh, no. I want to hear everybody. I need a surrender. I need, I need to surrender. surrender. What does surrender mean? Give it all to God. What? Give it all to God. Do you hold anything back? No. Are you sure about that? Why don't we hold back then? You're not really surrendering. Ah, then we're not surrendering. It's so without parlay. What? Without parlay. Honey, you come with some strange words. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Parlay is conditional. Oh, okay. So, Complete, right. utter, surrender. Okay, English, my dear. <laughs> okay, so surrender all forms of insecurities and worthlessness to the Lord. Whenever that emotion rises up in you, run to prayer. Run to prayer. Refuge yourself within the presence of God and give it to Him. Ask Him to replace that with confidence and strength. If, if need to, if you see this is a, a repetitive problem that is affecting relationships, is affecting, you need to see a counselor. You need to go, maybe a, 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 a Christian counselor, because now you got to be careful who you go to to get counseling. Yeah. Go to a Christian counselor to receive, because there's got to be some behavior modification. There's got to be a, a you got to address certain ugly issues in your past and let them go and bring in the new and live the new. You gotta change the way you think and do things. Some of you, I will, as God gives me, help you. But if I see the moment that this is for a professional help, I will tell you, go get help. So I know my limitations, Lord Jesus. Talk with a counselor, with a pastor, uh, a person of confidence whom can help you be accountable for these areas in your life. Stop looking for security. And value in the wrong places. Stop looking for security and to be valued in the wrong places. What? In relationships. What? In financial success. What? In beauty. In intellectualism. In perfection. Just stop it. You're not going to find it there. And be intentional. What does intentional be, mean? On purpose. On purpose. Be purposeful. Be intentional about viewing yourself the way God sees you. And if you do not like how you feel, then what's the first thing you need to change? Is the way you think. Remember that God decides our value. Say, God decides my value. God decides my value. So he's the only one who estimates your value, my value, not the world, not ourselves, not our possessions, not anyone, only God, because he's the one that created us. So that means that a sober or true evaluation of our worth can only be determined by God. Our value is priceless. You know, yourself, my value is priceless. Okay? So if Jesus, the only Son of God, died for us, we must be worth a great deal. This means that our intrinsic worth is not based on what we do or what we have. John 3.16 so, what four things should I not do? Number one, don't let other people's thoughts about you shape how you think about yourself. Don't let mama come to you and say, you know, you're a little good for nothing and blah, 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 blah. No, excuse me, mom. No, you, you know what? That's your personal opinion and I don't come into agreement with it. You know what? I am a child of God. I have value, whether you see it or not. I, why you always... Have to comb your hair like that. Why can't you listen? Oh, you know, 
what people say to you, I'm sorry, what people say to you, that if it's negative, guess what? Drop it to the wayside. You don't personalize it. Problem is that we want to be accepted and we want to please the people so we believe their lies. And the enemy, you, how many know, how many here, I know all of you know, please tell me. How many of you here know that the enemy uses other people to come at us? Amen. Okay. How many know that the enemy has haters out there, instruments, even within the church, mm -hmm. to come and stumble us? Okay. So, <coughs> uh, there are many people who allow themselves to be forever shaped by what others have said or done to them. And these people easily become approval addicts. I hope that we don't have approval addicts here. Okay? They look for others for their self-esteem. It's like they're saying, please love me so I can love myself. Please accept me so I can accept myself. And the people will always find a shortage of self-respect because they never allow themselves to break free from the grip of what others think about them. Second, please don't speak badly about yourself. Please do not speak badly about yourself. Don't let your mistakes or your weaknesses define who you are. We learn from our mistakes. We grow in our mistakes, but they don't define who we are. Don't say, I'm a loser. No one loves me. I hate myself. Because you will learn to believe what you say. So what are you saying of yourself as of late? But if you say to yourself, I'm a person worth loving and respecting, you will start to believe it about yourself. Again, if you don't like something about yourself, instead of dwelling on it, focus on something more positive. There's that mind thing. It's a whole mind thing. Remind yourself of your strength and the qualities you have to offer to others. For example, I'm a loyal friend. I'm a good listener. I'm kind. I'm a hard worker. You know, we're going to do a little project here when this is over. When I'm done with the procrastination, we're going to do a little project here. And and you guys are, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you up in team. Let me see. Two Two, two, two. Perfect. Woo! Perfect. I want everybody to be here that day. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen. I want everybody to be here. I'm not going to tell you. It'll be after the procrastination. We're going to have an activity, and you guys be prepared, because you're going to get to speak proudly and, and, and admire the next sister and talk positive things about your sister. So start thinking about positive things to tell your sister. And don't. <laughs> Which one? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> are we doing it like that? Are you gonna sign some? I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna pray about it. Yeah, I'm gonna ask the okay. Lord. How do you want me to sign these girls? Mm -hmm. So just in general, <laughs> start thinking positive thoughts. So number three, don't let anybody force you to be or do anything you don't wish to be or do in order to gain their approval or friendship. It, don't let anybody force you to be or do Anything you don't wish to be or do in order to gain their approval or friendship. Has anybody ever experienced that? Where yeah. somebody says, you know, they're trying to force you to do, I'll be your friend if you do this, if you do that. You know, they're kind to you until you set limits and then they disappear from you. Don't let anybody force you to be or do anything you don't wish to be or do in order to gain their approval or friendship. Condition. Mm. Finally, don't violate your own moral code. Don't violate your own moral code. What am I talking about? Um, those of you, let me look this way. Look at these little holes I gotta fix. <laughs> those of you that are in dating, yes. Oh, you know, and the guy just starts like, oh my god, my mom preached on it last night. Oh, my God. Yesterday, she was preaching about it. And, you know, they have to respect that. Respect your own body. You know, there's some guys out there that like to push the end. Well, let me just put it this way. There's some girls out there that have been pushing the envelope, too. Give yourself to respect, okay? Don't violate your own moral code. If you know that the heavy petting goes somewhere it shouldn't, don't do anything at all. Keep a limit and be in groups. But if you start taking a little taste, your flesh will go out of control and you're going to end up somewhere you shouldn't be. Give yourself to respect. Let the guy, you know, I, I'm, I have convictions. I'm a Christian person and 
I love God above all, so therefore what he has placed in me, I have to protect, I have to guard, and I have to be holy, for he is holy. Because this girl here is a prudent virgin. 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 Sorry. A prudent virgin. Sorry. Virgin. Y'all get the, 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 the gist of it. Uh, una, una virgen prudente. No me dejo tocar, no me dejo sobar, no me dejo... Why? Because I'm protecting the Holy Spirit within me. I'm going to keep and I'm going, I'm not going to let anybody else violate my moral code. Same thing with speaking in conversation. You don't have to participate of the gossip. You don't have to participate of the bullying. You don't have to participate of the thievery. You don't, you know what? Stick to yourself. Don't violate your own moral code. Okay? So in order for you, and this is, I'm going to finish here. In order for you to maintain your healthy self-worth, you need to first challenge your inner critic. You need to challenge that inner critic. Sometimes we're growing up, and, and again, I'm just sharing a little bit of my experience, but we grow up with a very strong-minded, uh, independent, critical mom, right? And so we are afraid of her. You know, I remember my mom, all she had to do was look at us, and we're like, you know, we're so afraid of our, our mom, okay? And so that tends to play on us as we get older, okay? And so we still hear voices even in our 40 years of age, we need to challenge that inner critic. We need to stop comparing ourselves. We need to stop comparing ourselves. And I'm gonna, let me elaborate real quick about this. Theodore Roosevelt once said, comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. The Bible says that um, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So when I give in and I compromise and I'm so busy looking at comparisons and I'm comparing myself, I allow that to steal the very thing that God has placed in me and that is the joy of my salvation. The joy of who I am, uniquely, fearfully, wonderfully made. This is me. Okay? Nothing will drag you down faster than comparing yourself to somebody else. And everyone, 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 no matter how famous or seemingly perfect they seem to be, they each, all of them, have their own struggles and issues that they deal with on a daily basis. In the age of social media, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Chessnap, Instagram, okay? In the age of social media and celebrity, the images and lifestyle people portray online are rarely ever an accurate picture of their life. Okay? I'm just throwing it out there, guys. Be mindful of your thoughts. Be aware of how you're thinking. Think about why you're thinking on that. Think about, okay, I'm thinking this. Why am I thinking and where is this coming from? Should I be thinking this? And then how am I going to replace this? And where, you know, you need to start thinking that. Think about before you open your mouth. Mom talked about that yesterday. I see you. This is your meal. Bah, bah. Before you open your mouth, think about what you're going to say. Being prudent means that you let, you drink a cup of water, you're letting this just process before you spit it out. Because once you spit out what you're going to say, you can't take it back. So be mindful of your thoughts and find activities that are worthwhile to help others. You want to feel good about yourself? You want to boost your self-esteem and self-worth? How about helping somebody else? Sometimes we're just all about me, myself, and Irene. Me, myself, and I. You know, have you seen me, myself, Irene? You know, it's about his own mental health issues. You know, it's all about his disorder. And it's all about him. It's all about him. It's always about him. And sometimes we make, we make things worse because we only, it's, we're so selfish. We're, it's all about us, my needs, my wants, my time, when, and this and that. And it's like, how about can you give to others? Can you make a change in somebody else's life? Can you think about somebody else? And oftentimes... It's in the helping of others that we ourselves receive the help and receive the healing that we need. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you were bought at a price. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You were bought at a price. I was bought at a price. Therefore, we have an obligation, a responsibility to glorify God in our bodies and in our spirit, which who, they belong to who? They belong to God. So one of the last things is, again, I reiterate, grow, grow, grow your relationship with God. Questions right now?
Did you get something out of it? Mm -hmm. Ale, tell me one thing you got today. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Stephanie, one thing you got today while Alice looking at her notes. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for that. God defines my value. Perfect. What about you, Stephanie? I must grow my relationship with God. I must grow my relationship with God. Ali, did you find yours? No, no, no. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Evelyn. Uh, when our image has been breached, the enemy breaches the door, which is how he, he gets in, and then he establishes a base of operation in our mind, which becomes a mental stronghold. But it's like, essentially the door is key. Oh. <laughs> Mouthful, huh? Yeah. A day, one thing. How all these vultures are kind of knitted together? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maritza, one thing. Um. It's the comparison part that I notice. I do that a lot. Oh, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Marty. Um, the fact that the enemy attacks us even from our mother's womb mm -hmm. or as infants. Yes. His entire goal is to distort God's image in us mm -hmm. and to eventually replace God's image with a false image, yes. which is then a stronghold. Yes. Yes. Happy birthday, girl. Tell me one thing you got. You Alexis. Me. <laughs> a whooping. No, what what did you get? She yeah, says a whooping. She <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um clarify that please. Which part was your whooping? All of it. <laughs> oh Lord Jesus. Oh, One part, time. Lexi, please! Um, you know we all miss that stuff when she's here, so stop. Um, <coughs> how the image of God has been distorted by the punches. Oof. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that stuff right Lots here, of punches. that was yeah. there. Yeah. Mm hmm Thank you for that illustration, too. Ali! <laughs> um, last, the best for last. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, <laughs> that I have to feed my faith, must grow relationship with God. I think I get to worry about like growing my relationship with my parents because I know they're going to retire pretty soon. Okay. So like I do spend a lot of time with them. Sometimes I do give up my time with God to like be with them, especially at night when I'm like chit-chatting. Yeah. And um, it's not that I'm not supposed to be with them, you know, but I have to prioritize God at all times. Okay. Because, yeah. okay. So finding balance. Yes. Right. Good. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody have prayer requests? You can you can stop the recording. Any prayer requests right now? I do.